I'm Shartia Brantley, Deputy New York Bureau Chief and Senior Editor for Bloomberg Live. And I'm excited to discuss representation, hip hop culture, and the movement for racial equality with LL Cool J, CEO and founder of Rock the Bells, hip hop icon, actor, and philanthropist. Welcome, LL. Thank you, and thank you for that wonderful intro. It's, it sounds better than it feels sometimes. Like, yo, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Thank you, I appreciate well, it. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are very excited to have you here. Um, you wear many hats, CEO, hip hop icon, and more. And we'll explore your perspectives through those lenses um, throughout this discussion. But first, how are you doing? And how have recent events affected you as a black man in America? Well, um, I think, uh, you know, I feel good. You know, my family is good, thankfully, um, and, and, and thank God. And, uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of how things have affected me, uh, it just, you know, just it fosters even more determination and, and, and makes me want to uh, maximize my potential that much more because I understand how important it is. Um, I think that, you know, um, you know, you know, if you apply, you know, you know, if you applied Occam's razor to a really, really... Um, complex situation, right? And if you try to simplify it, I think we live in a world where there, it's, it's, it's almost like there's an ideological union and an ideological confederacy, and they are bumping heads. And, um, you know, for me, I, I think that I just want to stay encouraged. Um, I want to continue to inspire not only my people, but all of the people that think they should be on the right side of history. And it's that simple. And, um, you know, that's that's how I'm moving. I don't think, you know, a spirit of bitterness is going to get it done, but I don't think a spirit of weakness is going to get it done either. I think it's about um, resolve and, and, and being determined, and uh, it's about, you know, sticking to the high road, you know what I mean, and, and really, um, you know, applying ourselves in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way, in a way that's going to be effective, and um, that's what I'm doing. So, yeah, as a, you know, a black man in America, I'm encouraged by so many people that are on the right side of history and looking at this, these times in the right way. And uh, it will get better. And it has gotten better over the years and it will continue to get better, you know. But better doesn't always mean good enough, I think. But it, 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 the, the, the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. So many have observed the diversity of the peaceful uh, protesters in the U.S. and around the globe um, as a signal that something is different this time. Is this yeah. a moment in time or is this a movement? Well, it's definitely, it's both, right? It, it, is, it, is, an epo it is a moment in time, but it is also a movement. Um, and I think that social media has just, you know, social media is doing for the world what the news did for the world in the 60s. Right. Like there was news reports and different things in the 60s during that era, civil rights era. And I think social media has connected people from all over the globe and people see. They know the difference between right and wrong and right and wrong and illegal and illegal are separate ideas. Right. Because something can be legal and wrong and it can be illegal and right. It's just a matter. Of, so I think the world is seeing that. You know, the world is, look, has, has made their choice, made their statement. And their statement is, look, everybody deserves to be treated with humanity. And, you know, n n no one de deserves to be treated like, um, you know, the, 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 their, um, you know, deer on a, a weekend hunting trip. You know, it, it, you know, it, it needs to, people need to be treated right. And that's no... That's not to say anything negative about people that choose to hunt. I'm not talking about because that doesn't make you a bad person. I'm saying human beings shouldn't be hunting. Um, and, and that's what sometimes it feels like is happening. I think people feel like that may be happening. They see that happening. So I think the world will continue to um, embrace the right side of history. Look, the, right, the, the history tells the story, right? I mean, you look at someone like U.S. Grant, you look at the things that have happened in this in this country, I mean, you know, the right side of history is going to prevail, you know, you know, so it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. 
Let's talk a little bit about representation in media and entertainment. Uh, we're still mourning the death of Chadwick Boseman, who portrayed historical figures and brought comic book hero King T'Challa to life. Um, how is how important is representation, uh, especially at this time? Well, it's hugely important. I mean, um, it's it's that's humanity, right? Like. Like the thing that makes beautiful, the thing that makes music beautiful is when you have many different notes and different octaves blended together. That's what makes a song beautiful. You can't, you know, you know, beautiful music isn't made with just one note. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so you can't, you know, this idea that, you know, there's only one sandbox and only certain people can play in it is kind of is really a flawed premise that that comes from, you know, that that's more about fear and about um, a lack of self-awareness than anything else. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, if you know how to make your dreams come true, you're not interested in putting your foot on someone else's neck to make their dreams, to make your dream, to, 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 to in order to make your dreams come true for free, if that makes sense, with no investment. Um, so now, to go back to, to Chad, I would say, look, the, the characters he brought to life, whether it was Jackie Robinson or James Brown or, you know, the, the, the King T'Challa um, uh, character. I mean, it's amazing what he did for the black community in his short time on Earth. I think it was an, um, an amazing thing. I think that, you know, Marvel and that whole Black Panther movie just kind of completely blew the doors off of the myth that, you know, African-Americans couldn't sell internationally. I think we all know that's flawed. I think that's just the way somebody wanted it to be, not really how it was. You know what I'm saying? And so um, I think that he definitely changed the game. And in terms of representation, I think that's what it's about, right? Like, I don't think that we need to exclude anyone. I think that the world, the story of the world includes many different kinds of people. That is the story of Earth. That is the story mm -hmm. of the world we live in. So this idea that somehow we're going to make it a story about only one group is just not realistic, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and, and that goes for education, that goes for all levels. Because when you, when you talk about education and when you hear these conversations about, um, I think that, I don't think that, I don't think learning your history and um, the, like on all levels and being, um, are, are, is synonymous with being anti-American, because you can love your country and know all the flaws and all of the things that have made the, you know, all the things that have been wrong and all the things that have been right. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can, you know, love a family member, but still, you know, reprimand them for things that you feel aren't correct. You know what I mean? So, you know, it doesn't mean that someone isn't part of the American family because they maybe have a critique or a, 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 a criticism about a certain aspect of our society. We don't have to hate our country. And, um, you know, this idea that you can't learn about the, the things that the, 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 the hurtful and painful part of our history and the painful part of our past, um, because that is somehow um, fosters anti-American sentiment. I think that's, I think that's wrong. I think that the problem mm -hmm. is that when you sprinkle in a lot of, judgment and you sprinkle in a lot of uh, um, other kinds of, of, of biases, then it can lead to that. It can be a gateway to that. But I think you have to, you know, I, I think as a country, we should know it all. We should know all about everything that happened, you know, and we shouldn't try to hide from that. So how do we bring people together? So much divisiveness in this country right now? How do we bring people together to support one another? I think you bring together the people that want to be brought together. And I think that, you know, the people that don't want to be brought together just get left out in the cold. That's just the way the world works. You know, you, you know my grandmother used to tell me, smile in the world, a smile with you. Cry and you cry alone. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, you know, like, to bring the world together, there are a lot of good people of all ethnicities, of all religions, um, you know, um, I don't know when you, if, if we're going live, but today is, you know, I believe the beginning of Rosh Hashanah and, you know, so Shana Tavad, certain people, and they're, they're all ethnicities, they're all cultures that, 
that love one another and want to coexist. And then you have small extremist groups out there in the world who believe that they're the only ones that deserve certain things and deserve to live a certain way. And they're the ones that need to kind of just be ostracized and left out until their, their you know, children can be taught to think better and differently without being, without losing who they are as hu human beings, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Well, let's talk about the role of music during these times. You know, music reflects the times that we're in. Uh, how would you describe the role of hip hop at such a critical time? Well, I, you know, hip hop has always been at the forefront of social justice. You know, you know, whether it's songs like I Made Like a Legal Search or you have Public Enemy or, you know, um, Ice Cube or, you know, so many artists have done such a great job in that area and, and spoken so much to social justice and you know hip hop because you know as a culture our ears to the street you know like i i literally i'm still all the way tapped in with what's going on in the street like for real like you know and you can't get separated from that and i think people get kind of removed from that and they forget what's going on or they only pay they only pay attention to one part of the street you know, the street doesn't always only mean the corner and the sidewalk. The street could be a person just entering the job market. The street could mean the, the person next door. The street can mean the person that, you know, was looking for a merit raise and didn't get it, but they ended up getting a new job with a 25% raise and they're going crazy and their friends are happy for them. The street can mean a lot of things. So, um, you know, to me, I think that that, you know, hip hop has always been part of that conversation. You know, we, you know, whether I made songs like Around the Way Girl, where I'm talking about the young lady next door and just trying to lift her up and build her self-esteem, or, you know, other songs as well. So classic hip-hop, timeless hip-hop, is always at the forefront of, of, of social justice and change, and I think in a good way, because whether we're describing the, the, the ugliness or the beauty, you know, that's what poetry and art is about, right? You know, you, you know, you got some people that think the Statue of David should have a pair of sweatpants on. So some people don't want to hear anything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so you know, but um, I think we, you know, I think hip hop has always been at the forefront. Now, are you satisfied with the younger voices and what they're saying today and how they're leveraging their platforms uh, during this time? I think they're doing an amazing job. I think that all generations, I think that on all fronts, I think the community, the, the community that cares about justice is multi-generational. Um, you know, you see artists like Little Baby doing incredible things and so many artists have just done really great things. So absolutely, I think that this is, in, this is multi-generational. This is not about, it's not about saying, okay, I'm a Gen Xer, so I only care about Gen Xers. My thing is, I just want you to remember us. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, everybody's like, baby boomer millennial, Gen X is like, good night. We don't, we don't know who you are. It's like, I just want to be remembered. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, I think that many people of, you know, all ages, ethnicities, religions, all genders, of all, are all, um, I think, moving this thing in the right direction. You know? Yes, you're going to have people kicking and screaming. You know, you know, the, the Wicked Witch, yeah, she cries when the house lands on her. But that's part of the, you know, but that's part of the journey. You know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely. So although, you know, you wear many hats, you are still an MC, and your Black Lives Matter freestyle went viral a couple of months ago. Uh, let's yeah. hear a little bit of it right now. Chauvin would be at home, feeling justified because of George skin tone. I'm telling it to those with melanin, you're not alone. The new Malcolm Martin and Marcuses are now grown. America's a graveyard full of black men's bones. And I ain't got to tell you that Breonna Taylor got slayed in her own home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. so... I watched the entire two minute and 36 seconds of it, and I recommend everyone else uh, does that as well. Um, what compelled you to do this, and what has been the response? What compelled me to do it is I just felt like, you know, people had to know where I stand. Um, you, know, you know, me being successful in America, a lot of times people try to point and say, see, there's no racism or these things, but see, I'm an anomaly. I'm not the rule. And, uh, you know, I can't allow the things that have gone well in my life to 
cause me to forget or pretend that there aren't other out people out there that are really being treated unjustly, you know? And, uh, you know, you have this woman, you know, she's asleep in a house and, you know, cops kick down our door and kill her and then they, you know, want to write the family a check. Well, that's not really justice. That's compensation. And then I don't even know what that means because, you know, the Australian woman who was killed, her family, they got 65 million. They gave Brianna 12. So what are we, what are we talking about here? You know, what does that mean? Um, so what does that imply? So, you know, um, I've just been trying to really, you know, speak from the heart. What I'm not going to do, um, I'm not going to be painted in a corner. I'm not the guy that's out here trying to demonize white people. I don't move like that. That's not my style. This is about those that are in the wrong, and they know who they are. You know what I'm saying? Um, so this is this ideology. Anybody who 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 thinks that that's okay, they're not my. They're not. You know, we're not on the same team. Period. Um, mm -hmm. But those who but those who understand where I'm coming from, we are. But what I'm not trying to do, I don't want to demonize the country. I don't want to try to um, you know pretend as though I don't. There, there's no gratitude for us being here in terms of what we are able to do in America. However, the people within our community deserve to be treated justly. And that's what that, that freestyle was about. And that's why it was received very well. It's, I don't know, 15, 20 million views now. And that's why. Because, you know, it was from the heart. And it, I wasn't trying to sugarcoat it. But I'm also not trying to demonize. I'm speaking our truth and my truth. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Let me just ask this because and we're going to talk more about Rock the Bells, but you are a company owner. So when yeah. you're speaking out like this, are there any concerns? You know, are you concerned? Are your team, are they concerned about how you're speaking out and whether or not that may deter future investors or turn away some uh, fans or customers? Uh, mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Deal with that. Well, you know, the thing about the, the, the beauty about what, what we do at Rock the Bells is that, you know, I operate on the moral, the moral high ground. You know what I mean? I'm not, you know, like I said, we don't demonize and uh, we don't try to, you know, point figures and say you're all bad and point and, and, and paint with a really broad br brush. This is we are very specific about the conversation. And I think um, pre preci being precise with your words is important. You know, to the best of your ability, obviously. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a linguist. You know what I'm saying? But being precise with your speech is important. And um, so the, the reality is there's an honesty and a truth and an authenticity in what we do that doesn't come from that spirit of hate and that spirit of bitterness. So it's not like you can never get a negative rub, you know, rocking with LL Cool J or rocking with Rock the Bells or doing something with us because it comes from a place of truth. And we're speaking to the goodness and the righteousness in human beings. We're just speaking from the POV of a company that's been there, that's that's entrenched and immersed deeply in this culture and really understands what the community has been going through. So, no, I'm not I'm not concerned with that. Um, I think that there are plenty of people out there who understand, who want to connect with Generation X, who want to connect with hip hop culture, who want to want their company to be able to connect in, a, in an authentic way with the community, but they just don't know how. And then, you know, it, 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 then they either get swept up in, in somebody either is super radical or in, in with, no, with all hate and no love and no truth, or you have people who are tap dancing and doing the step it and fetch it thing and, and, and like just completely selling their people out. But there is a, a true, a true um, ground, a middle ground of truth where, you know, you can really just kind of, you know, talk to the people and connect with them in a real way without, um, you know, like, you know, you can go with a scalpel and not a, uh, and not just swinging a bat wildly. You know what I'm saying? And I think that I think that operating with a scalpel instead of swinging a bat wildly allows us to tell the truth and still maintain great relationships. Um, you know, great vibes with great people. Um, you know, I have wonderful people involved in the company. You know, you know Jeff Jeff Yang from Redpoint. Um, you know, is my partner in the company. Um, you know, Mark Cuban from Radical Ventures. They invested. Uh, Glenn Glenn uh, Hutchins from North Island invested. Irvin Azoff. 
uh, invested. Professor um, Henry Lewis Skip, Skip Gates, you know, he, he um, invested. Um, Bozema St. John, you know, CMO of, of Netflix invested. I mean, so we have a lot of um, great people from, you know, all, you know, ethnicities and, you know, many different um, uh, worlds that have decided that they want to be a part of what we're doing. And I think that's because we're truthful, we're authentic, and we're real without, you know, demonizing, you know, the entire world. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not necessary to do that. So, you know, you started off with Rock the Bells Radio in 2018. And as you mentioned, you've expanded to this platform where there's tons of content, uh, merchandise, and, and such. Uh, why did you feel this was a great opportunity and a, a great uh, white space, if you will, uh, to build something for classic hip hop? Well, Generation X has $2.4 trillion in spending power. A, a, a huge portion of Generation X are huge classic and timeless hip hop fans, and they've been ignored, basically. They've been ignored. Um, I, I, you know, in doing the Rock the Bells on Sirius XM, shout out to uh, Scott Greenstein, Steve, and um, Dion, and Jay. Um, in doing that, Doing that station, I learned a lot. That channel, I learned a lot about what Generation X was missing when it comes to hip hop. You know, people are so focused on the millennial audience, which I have no problem with, but they're so focused on artists that appeal to the millennial audience that they forgot about the LL Cool J's and the Run DMC's and the Beastie Boys and the, and the and, you know, and the Eric B and Rakim's and the Big Daddy Kane's and the Salt and Peppers and the Queen Latifah's and the, you know, there's a whole world that the early Eminem and the Dr. Dre, like there's a whole world that, that exists that people have kind of, kind of glossed over because they're thinking only about, you know, an act that appeals to a certain artist. I mean, a certain audience, a millennial audience, but us, you know, I found out that Generation X was on fire. Um, they want premium experiences. They want content. They want they want to they want to know that they are represented. And here's the beauty of it: because we appeal to Generation X so much, they're introducing Gen Z to what we're doing. So we actually over-index with Gen Z without trying and without chasing. So I, I just I just found out that Generation X was starving for something. And I felt like, and I knew that classic hip hop is a big part of it because classic hip hop gives you the underpinnings of all pop culture. When you look at shows like Power, you know, 50, that comes from classic hip hop. When you think about Martha and Snoop or you see Snoop in a Corona commercial, that's classic hip hop. When you, you know, when you see the Last Dance documentary celebrating Michael Jordan and the, the whole soundtrack is classic hip hop. I mean, this, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Um, so... Um, I felt like, you know what, that's an opportunity. It's something that I've been doing my entire life. It's not like the celebrity that gets on TV and tap dances his way into some kind of company. I've been doing it my whole life. And I said, you know what, I want to open up the aperture and include, you know, more fans in it, but also give these other artists um, an opportunity to be lifted up and get their legacies preserved and celebrated. And that was another piece as well, because... I felt like, just to digress a little bit, I felt like, you know, the, the, the Bob Dylans and the Mick Jaggers, they get the love and the respect as they should. But you know what? The Rakims and the Nas's and the, 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 the LL Cool J should get their respect and the, you know, as well. And the Big Daddy Kane's, they should be lifted up as well. So I wanted to make sure that these artists were treated like the icons that they truly are. Salt and Pepper are queens. They made a huge impact on the world, a huge impact on hip hop. They should be celebrated for such, for that, for, for what they have accomplished. And that's what Rock the Bells is about. So what we have is we have three pillars, content, mm -hmm. commerce, and the community or experiential. And, uh, you know, the content, we tell the stories, you know, with the, with the, with the commerce, we have a curated shop, it's not like some kind of superstore. It's a curated shop with all things co co closely connected to hip hop and only through that filter. And then we have, you know, our, our experiential, which will come in, in due time post COVID. We have a plan together to do some great things. Okay, I have two more questions before we go. One, you have used your platform for years to support get out the vote efforts. How are you doing mm -hmm. that for the upcoming presidential election? Well, you know, recently I just I decided to lend my support to whenweallvote.org. Um, uh, and I, I've also just been encouraging people to vote in general. Um, but, you know, one of the things I got to say, and I think, you know, 
I think, you know, my man Ice Cube has, you know, and a lot of people get a little mad with him when he talks about his contract with Black America. But, you know, this idea that, you know what, the Black vote should not be taken for granted. Um, people shouldn't assume that they have it. I, I do think that there is value in the idea of people delivering, you know, their agenda. What is your agenda? What is your platform? And how is that going to affect the black community? I think that that's worth exploring deeper. I don't think, you know, I think that that's true. I think that we should um, get some good things, some, 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 there should be some economic incentives included in how we approach, um, you know, voting. So, yes, I, I encourage people to vote. Yes. But I do think that, you know, these the, the, these parties need to come to the table and say, hey, you know, you know, this is what we're willing to offer. Because me, I, I'm registered independent. You know, there's people always wonder what I am. I'm registered independent. I do what I want to do. Um, uh, I know what I feel needs to happen now, and uh, I'm clear. But I just think that we need to make sure that these platforms really speak to our communities, just like they speak to other communities. Because when I say speak to the black community specifically, that doesn't mean that I don't want them to, or sh they shouldn't speak to other communities as well. I'm just saying give the black community that, that same level of respect and, and let us know what you're gonna do and how we can, you know, how this is gonna make us better as a people and how this is gonna improve our standing in the American community. Okay, final question. We have an executive audience tuning in. As a CEO mm -hmm. and company founder, what are you doing at this time to keep your employees and colleagues uh, listed um, because it's been such a year? You know, I, I tell them a lot of stories about morale. I think morale is huge. I think it was, um, I think Napoleon said uh, um, uh, morale is three to one, an army you, to, you know, to everything else. Like, it's three times as important as everything else. It, it, the, the army marches on his stomach, but morale is truly important. And it is. So I just try to, especially now, I would, I would encourage, you know, all of the uh, CEOs out there who are dealing with trying to keep their teams connected and together when there's no physical contact and when you're kind of dealing with everybody virtually to, you know, to try to do some social distancing lunches if you can, to try to tell some stories when you can, and to try to be transparent with your team and, and let them know that you care about them individually because people need to know that you hear them and that you hear their voice. So I always try to make sure that my team knows you know, all of the employees, the whole team knows that um, I hear their voices, um, I, I understand their concerns, and even if I make a decision that goes against, you know, the idea or the concept that they had in mind, they should, they'll know why, and they, they have to understand that I have their best, best interests at heart, ultimately. So I would just say focus okay. on morale and tell fun stories and, you know, let the rest work itself out, you know what I mean? 